Hey everyone and welcome to Backseat Sports. I'm Josh and that is Caleb. Woo! And guys, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, Husker fans, one and all. Nebraska is heading into important final two games of the year with a Maryland game this weekend. We're coming off of a an interesting Wisconsin loss. It wasn't the worst thing ever for Nebraska football. I think at least fans were able to watch an interesting game. We're going to have to talk about it all. What's up, Caleb? Yeah, I mean... We got to watch a fun game. We had some false hope there. Yep, we led yep. on the scoreboard at one point in the game. Which we ran the ball pretty well. I, finally, we got to see some Dedrick Mills this week. I think that was, again, Josh and I had kind of said that Dedrick Mills hasn't really gotten a fair shake quite yet. And yeah. we just hadn't really got to see him, what he could, what he could not do. So it was just really nice to get to see Dedrick Mills have a really good game, to have him feel good about 188 yards. You know, he was averaging a first down a carry against Wisconsin. Not really yeah. an easy thing to do. Uh, finally, I guess maybe the coaching staff saw something that we can exploit on the run game. And we finally got to do it. We, I finally felt like if it was a mix of Dedrick Mills getting to run well, a good blocking scheme, our coaches, that was a, a good thing to see. We also saw Adrian Martinez, I think, have his best play of the year. That was the QB read, and he made the right read and got that 50-yard play. And then Dedrick Mills... Ripped it off for another good yard. That was a pretty good sequence. Obviously, it didn't end up in points, which we'll talk about with the bad. But that was, I guess, the two good things that I saw. How about you, Josh? Yeah, I mean, back to the running game. The offensive line definitely played their best game of the year, at least on the ground when it came to run blocking. They, they played really well. They actually got to the second level a little bit, which was shocking to see. You're like, whoa, yeah, we were watching they're actually the tape. getting some blocks downfield here. What's happening? This My is mind crazy. was blown when they pick, like, yeah, to see Cam Jurgens or anyone pick up a linebacker, it was, yeah, it was a religious experience. Let me tell you, yeah, ya. definitely mind blowing. And, and again, I, I'll echo what you said it for sure. I mean, Diedrich looked great, ran his best game of the year by far. I it was definitely a mix of the offensive line performance plus Diedrich's, you know, better vision in this game that allowed for him to play a fantastic game with pushing nearly 200 yards again. But again, on the offensive line, I think Cam Jurgens played probably his best game of the year. Trent Hickson played a really good game as well, which is good to see from those younger guys. I mean, moving into next season, we're going to need all the help we can get on the offensive line. And it's obviously still the area that needs the most improvement. Though saying it was a great game for the offensive line, you, you just definitely cannot say that. There were some instances where you're just, we were, everyone was just like, what <coughs> are Wilson. they doing? Uh, Bo Wilson on that final play of Nebraska's offensive day. Just absolutely dis high quality. The, the saddest, funniest thing you could, the most stereotypical Nebraska offensive line thing you could possibly see for this year. He basically tripped on nothing or was just completely blind. One of the two. He has Farniak no excuse had, for what had happened on that ones one. Too. Farniak had some rough ones. I mean, Special there, was, plays. there was the one play where Adrian Martinez got sacked and there was like chop blocks on the offensive line and they basically chop blocked no one. He got sacked. Well, anyway, there is there's definitely some bad plays in the offensive line, but overall, specifically on the ground, offensive line had a good day. There were some instances where Martinez finally had some good pockets to throw the ball in this game, and we have not been seeing that this year. We're so used to seeing Adrian have to, you know, pull down the ball or flip out of the pocket and go to his left or his right or something like that and try to scramble for yards. But this game, he actually had a few instances where he was able to throw some strikes have the time he needed to make the plays. And that was miss, finally good to see throws. a few instances where we finally saw some stable offense. I mean, against the solid Wisconsin defense, that was at least a positive, something that I was really excited to see. I still am not convinced on Adrian Martinez being back. Scott Fred said he was the Adrian Martinez of old. I don't buy that one bit. I saw way too much negatives, but one I also bit. did see some positives. I don't believe it one bit. I don't. I just don't. I don't know. Caleb's don't, just a salty old boomer. I just don't think he'd come back, man. He's still slow on decisions. Obviously, the 20-yard sack was the, the most boneheaded thing that you could have ever done uh, on that play. Like, just get it out of your hands if there's really no one. Still was open on that play, if you guys remember. I'm not a fan of Martinez at this point. I, I obviously, know. we disagree on that. I think Martinez is still there. He's getting back into form. Mentally, he was out of it these past few weeks, and I think he's finally getting back into it. And this was the game where we finally saw good things from Martinez on the ground it was and more, in the air. It was more of the off. I mean, the thing is, we thought if the offensive line gave him some pocket and we gave some rushing stuff that he would improve dramatically, but he still didn't. He did uh, improve dramatically. He did. No, he did not. Yes, he did. On what point? Where? Like, he was, he was still. He finally, he finally bust off some nice runs. 
He made, but he, he, was, he zipped he was, in some balls. He was still inaccurate. He was still in, in, he was inaccurate in throwing, and he was slow on decision making. Which the is receivers still, played like their worst game of the year. I that's mean, literally so the only person. False. That's so not false. Stole played literally, his best game. JD. He had two receptions. JD. Yeah, that was his best game. Cool, of the year. his best game was two receptions. No, the receiving core is literally terrible outside of JD Spielman when Wandale's not out there. But outside of JD, we have like the worst receiving core out of any of like the decent teams in the Big Ten. We have serviceable guys and there was stuff pre-read that he was not making or understanding or the coaching staff wasn't bringing in but it, it, it anyway he's not making the right reads still even i still believe by far line. adrian's the best bet for us to win games and it's not even close at this point so that's why I, I think it's ventral and it's not even close at this point yeah i mean we're definitely disagreeing on that one for sure so yeah i mean at the end of the day I, I think we saw a lot of positives with the offense, and I'm feeling a lot better about the direction the offense is headed for the rest of these last two games. But, 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 before we leave the offense, we have to talk about our red zone inefficiencies. This cannot be escaped. While Nebraska does get yards, we can't freaking finish. And I know well, it's everybody, more like fourth down inefficiency, especially in this game. I think it's just everything in the red zone. Our offensive line breakdown at points. Martinez obviously made bad plays at points. I feel like the plays were questionable at points as well. So I feel like it was a total just conglomeration of everything going wrong at some point or one thing falling apart. But we got to be able to punch the ball in. When we get to the point where we, we have rip off big chunk plays and we really feel like we have the momentum, like we got to be able to punch the ball in. We got to be able to figure out a way to put it in. We got into the red zone multiple times. You know, obviously that sack brought back. So then it was, we had to kick a 41 yard field goal. We missed. Yeah, two fourth down, two fourth down non conversions because we didn't feel like I didn't feel like we called great plays. And then also our offensive line kind of on second down. Both of those times really mess with us. But we have to get better at the red zone. Uh, I don't know. It's we got two games left. Is it too little too late? I don't know. But that's been so frustrating this whole year. It's just been that same thing. Well, a couple of our offensive line players have looked better. Dedrick Mills got to play a little bit better. And I felt like we schemed somewhat better. Uh, it was still just, you know, two steps forward, you know, three steps back at some points. I don't man. know, man. I, I don't have any problem with the, the play calling for the most part. I think it's more about the execution from the offensive line. The direct snap to Wyatt Mazur when we had already done it twice in the game and it kind of worked. I didn't like that play That's much. That's the only one where I was a little iffy on with well, well, and third then, and six and then with Wyatt on, Mazur. Like, there was also a designed QB run where it was like, where we were in a double tight end set that I didn't really like either. When defenses bring out their most complex schemes, which is generally on third and fourth down, that's when our offensive line really struggles. And they, they that communication just breaks down. We've seen that so many times this year. It just doesn't feel like there's any communication on the offensive line. And that might just be because of Matt Farniak's your captain, but generally your center has to be the quarterback of that core. And maybe Cam well, Durgens just isn't comfortable doing that at this point. Because I feel it like just also feels like throw a lot on second down lacking. too, and our second down has been really bad because Adrian is not great on second down. And that was just another thing that really carried over this week. Again, the fourth downs is just what killed us in this game. At the end of the day, if, if we can convert on two of them, we're in pretty good shape in the game and have a chance. And it just sucks that we weren't able to. And of course, missing the field goal hurts. And you can't be giving up a special teams touchdown like we did against a great Wisconsin team, especially right after you scored against them. You have some momentum going. That kills. Yeah, we we're up seven nothing, and then just one play later. Right. How many times did Josh have to scream it to the mountaintops that our special how teams our special is teams? garbage? Is yeah. how bad it is, and why won't they fix it? It drives me up a wall so much. Like there, it just makes no sense. Again, defensively, we still see some positives, see some negatives. I mean, obviously, at the end of the day, Jonathan Taylor still went for over two hundred yards, so not ideal. Obviously, but we kind of expected that. That's kind of what you assume. And again, he did that against Iowa last week. I mean, at the end of the day, you can still beat Wisconsin with Jonathan Taylor going for 200 yards, considering how one-dimensional their offense is. Defensively, I, there were some good things. There were some bad things, as there always are. I was decently happy with how the game went overall. I know we gave up a lot of yards, and it wasn't it wasn't an ideal scenario, but they were putting some tough situations. The, the biggest problem was when Cam Taylor went out in the second quarter. And it felt felt like our defense got was so lost. Boodle dropped back to safety, and seemed completely oh, lost back was, there. That was not good at all. I was he was out there just yeah. lost. He and he's terrible. not big. He's not big enough. That was a big time problem for Nebraska. We're really we're really really thin at safety, and when he got because Boodle back there, they were taking advantage out, yeah. of it. Defense was taking us to town while Cam Taylor was out. When he came back, the defense started to rebound a little bit. 
But, you know, it was just obviously at the end of the day, it's just too little too late. Damian Daniels played a really good game, I thought. He was he was really creating some chaos for Wisconsin. He was getting back in, into that line. He had some really good hits a lot of times, creating a lot of chaos. I was really impressed with how he played today, stepping into that. Uh, I thought that he was a – that was a bright spot and um, that he can actually be a, a pretty good contributor in the future for us too. Yeah, I mean, again, some younger guys that look pretty decent – Ty Robinson looked decent coming in and playing from, you know, his first significant snaps of the year. He yeah, looked he solid. Yeah, he really blew, like, one thing, really. Like yeah, which, I mean, play. you know, you're going to expect it once in a while from the younger guys. Garrett Nelson, again, looked like another solid player. We're, we're definitely excited about him for the future. And then uh, Will Honus, surprisingly, played a pretty solid game. Uh, Colin Miller, on the other hand, oh. had a rough one. That fumble where he was just ran past it like homie. Homie. Lay on the ball. Bro, have some awareness, man. But hey, those were some positives. Well, Honus actually hit Jonathan Taylor a couple times at the line of scrimmage. I was shocked. Yeah, I know. I, that's what I'm saying. Well, Honus played a pretty solid game. So there were some positives to, to look at for the, overall for the Huskers against Wisconsin. We, we could talk about this all day, but I think we're going to move on to the Maryland game yeah. and start to preview that. So for Maryland, four point spread right now. You know, favored. And, and Nebraska, you'd like to see a little bit more as on the road favorites. That's the worst thing points. you could say, Josh, on the road. It's That's pretty like solid. the three scariest words. For right. Nebraska for Nebraska football. at this point on the road is a pretty terrifying three word phrase. But um, the, the over under is 63 and a half. So a pretty high over under, which I think only makes sense for this type of game. It's going to be interesting. Maryland's on a five game losing streak right now. Obviously, we're coming in at a four game losing streak. But Maryland's been beat down over this stretch. 163 to 31 in in a three game stretch against Minnesota, Michigan, and Ohio State, Great. and uh, Ohio State put up like half those points. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, Ohio State put up seventy three of those points. So you know, not not ideal, but it can happen to anybody. We feel your pain for sure. At the end of the, at the end of the day, Maryland's had losses at Temple versus Penn State, at Purdue, against Indiana, at Minnesota, at home against Michigan, at OSU. So they've had a rough go at things. I mean, their schedule has not been easy. They've definitely struggled a whole lot. The only thing that really scares me on those like matchups, because we've had four of them, is Indiana. The, us both being really close against both of those teams, both playing a close game. It, it can really scare me that we can be about the same level of talent at points. And we've also seen, you know, Maryland at the beginning of the season play pretty well. So Maryland's three and seven. They don't have much to play for. They really can't get into a bowl game. How much pride do they have left to play for is really... My biggest question, because I think Josh Jackson is a pretty nasty quarterback for him. He's not throwing at a great percentage, only about 50%, but he's pretty dual terrible. threat. And um, that's terrifying for Nebraska because our outside linebackers are going to be containing that. <laughs> and that's a terrifying thought. We haven't really faced too many dual threats this year either. I mean, Justin Fields, but he most he really threw it a lot in the Ohio State game. So besides Justin Fields, we haven't seen too much of a dual threat style quarterback and that's pretty terrifying i think read options we can really get burnt as a team so how are you feeling about that josh well i mean defensively i think maryland's gonna have a, an opportunity to put up points again josh jackson is wildly inaccurate i mean he's, again 49.4 percent on the year he's definitely athletic he's definitely quick man he struggles to throw the ball downfield he, he likes heaving it up. He has no problem heaving it downfield, but they, they're kind of lacking Sounds weapons like on the outside. Sounds like a past Nebraska quarterback of ours. Right. They're lacking weapons on the outside, though. I mean, Dante Demas is their only real weapon. He's he's definitely athletic. He has quick cuts. He's hard to tackle, but he's their only receiver over 200 yards on the year. He has uh, 33 receptions for 517 yards and five touchdowns, averaging nearly 16 yards per reception, which is really nice. But they're, they're lacking weapons out there. When it comes to the running game, they've got Javon Leak. They've got Anthony McFarlane. I mean, McFarlane was definitely like the, one of the breakout players of the Big Ten last year, but he's been a little bit underwhelming this year, averaging less than five yards a carry. But uh, Javon Leak, though, has been playing really well for him at 7.6 yards per carry. He's been pretty efficient yeah, as a whole. gotten more of the, the load as the season's progressed. Yeah, which has been really interesting to see because everyone thought that Anthony McFarlane would come in here at the beginning of the year and light up the league, but that just has not been the case. Josh Jackson, though, has missed a few games, which is interesting. He missed the Purdue game and the Indiana game. You know, we don't have a great sample size for their offense against teams like us with Josh Jackson, unfortunately. 
because he's just been, they've just been beat down the last few weeks against really good teams. But when it comes to the defensive matchups, I'm definitely worried about our linebacking core, like Caleb said. It's going to be a tough job for Alex Davis on the outside. It's going to be tough for Colin Miller if he's Brennan Spy. I, I'm definitely worried in those instances for uh, Tanner, yeah, all them. for our outside linebackers and for our defense as a whole. They rely on big plays, and overall, I kind of like the matchup, to be honest. I am nervous because it's on the road. I I don't know. I don't know at this point. It's it's really. I feel like it's a kind of a coin flip toss of a game. I think the most interesting like argument is when it comes to like our same opponent. Both us and Maryland have played Minnesota, Purdue, Ohio State, and Indiana. So like Caleb mentioned, the Indiana games were close. We lost 38 to 31. They lost 34 to 28 without Josh Jackson. And then in the Ohio State game, they got beat down in Ohio State 73 to 14. Obviously, we lost 48 to 7 at home. Then the Purdue game, they again, Maryland didn't have Josh Jackson, but they lost 40 to 14 in Purdue. And we lost 31 to 27. And then, of course, the Minnesota game, they had Josh Jackson for this game. And uh, they lost 52 to 10 while we lost 34 to 7. So we definitely have the advantage when it comes to similar opponents. We've played all the opponents way better than Maryland has. And I think that's pretty telling. And I think overall, we're a way more balanced team offensively and defensively. And Maryland's defense has been absolutely obliterated by any solid offense this year. Yeah, I mean, there's there's definite holes. They're allowing over 200 yards on both sides this season. So, yes, it's, it's definitely not going to be... It will definitely be a barn burner. And I think it's going to just be a, a shootout style of a game. Yeah, they can't pass very well, but I think they're going to get a lot of rushing yards because I think quarterback rushing is a giant weakness for Nebraska, and they're going to exploit that, and I think our linebackers are going to make some bad decisions, some very poor decisions, and some poor tackling, and uh, it's going to be a frustrating game for sure. All right, so with that said, I think we can go into predictions, and uh, I guess I'll start us off. So I've got us winning and beating the spread 35 to 21 it's a little risky a little interesting but again i think i like our defensive matchups a lot more than most people we have something to prove in this game i mean if we lose if we lose this game it that'll be devastating for nebraska football as a whole and even even for the program it'll really let the wind out of the sails any win that we got left is going to be gone if we lose this game but i think our team's gonna come out with something to prove we're going to move the ball pretty effectively against Maryland, and their defense is so porous. I think Scott Frost's offense, it might just work for him this time around. Coming off of a tough game against Wisconsin, going into a must-win game against a much weaker opponent with a way a very volatile defense, I think the matchup, I think the narrative makes sense for Nebraska to come out and play a good game this time around. I know it's on the road. The boogeyman can show up. Sometimes Adrian Martinez just... It doesn't make sense why things happen on the road for Nebraska football as a whole. We turn the ball over. We make mistakes. I'm calling for the on-the-road performance for Nebraska football, 35-21, in a solid game for the Huskers overall. The way I see this game going is it's just going to be everybody is going to score points in this game. And it can really – I think it's going to come down to – turn. I'm just going to come down to turnovers. However, however many, you know, Adrian Martinez is going to hand over to Maryland and how many Maryland's going to hand over to us. I think it's really going to be a difference. Also, remember that uh, Maryland has been really good this season when it comes to kick returns. And we've been 120th in the country when allowing yards on kick returns. So, And they're third in the country in kick in, in uh, kickoff return yards. So I think that there is, they're, going to run, they're going to score a touchdown off a kick return this game. It's just going to be a crazy, wild college football type of game. Two heavyweights just slugging it out. We're just going to throw punches at punches at each other, not blocking or stopping anything. This is a late round fight where everybody's just throwing haymakers. I think it's going to be 53-42 Nebraska win. Wow. Yeah, it, it's Man, going to bet be that a over, wild people. One. Bet that over. Yeah. <laughs> it's 63, and I think, yeah, it's it's going to be the over. over 90 in your situation. Sheesh. Yeah, Dang. It's going, That's a I barn is, burner. Because I don't think Nebraska is going to be able to stop them. And I think... I think Maryland's going to show up at this game. And I don't know. I'm really 50-50 on the win-loss thing. But I'll pick Nebraska to win it. But I think it's going to be a crazy game, high scoring. We'll win this game because I hopefully Nebraska wants it more. Yeah, I mean, well, there you go. So I hope you guys enjoyed the video. I mean, drop all your comments down below. We know you guys got all your opinions about Nebraska football at this point in the year. I know the hype's a little bit lower, but we appreciate you guys sticking out till the end of this video. As always, follow us on Twitter, uh, Backseat Sports YT on Twitter. We're trying to, you know, really boost that uh, social media account and make it happen. And very fun you guys. on game days, especially. I know, trying to connect with you guys out there. So, as always, guys, I'm Josh. That's Caleb. This has been Backseat Sports, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.